late 1930s, the United States Army Air Force adopted a policy of having at least two aircraft for each of the perceived needs. Within this belts and braces approach, one of the medium bombers developed was the North American B-25. To describe this aircraft as a success is to understate the matter. Not only did it fulfill the original requirement, but it also served a myriad of other functions. It is one of the very few aircraft that have been flown simultaneously by the Air Force, the Navy and the Marines. And it was the air crew of those services who named it the Sweetheart of the Forces. Perhaps minor among its other distinctions is the fact that it was the only American aircraft of World War II to be named after an individual. For the B-25's official name, given to it after production had started, was the Mitchell. The 25's namesake was General Billy Mitchell, a far-sighted Army Air Corps general who saw service in World War I and predicted that future conflict would hinge upon the outcome of war in the air. Against considerable opposition from within both the Army and the Navy, he demonstrated the potential of air power with the sinking of a captured German battleship, with bombing from a primitive biplane. Mitchell's vision and his stubborn promotion of air power were badly out of step with the prevailing moods of the service chiefs, and with both Army and Navy allied against him, it was to cost him his career. Between the wars, the Army Air Corps, restricted in funds, was often limited to mercy flights, dropping food parcels, and was relegated to delivering the mail. mid-30s, air power was being more fully appreciated by other powers as an effective means to an end. Italy had used bombers with devastating effect over Spain, and by 1935, Mussolini's tools were being used against Ethiopia with overwhelming results. Against the primitive resources of Ethiopia, the impact of the Italian planes was crushing, and despite Haile Selassie's pleas to the League of Nations, nothing was done by the other powers. By 1936, the Emperor had been forced into exile, leaving his country to its fate and the League to its demise. The turning of world events produced a few tremors within the USA. And perhaps significantly, in that year, cadets from West Point were given their first formal training in aerial combat. Nineteen thirty six 1936 was also the year in which North American Aviation committed their company to aircraft production with a new factory in Los Angeles. For the day, their product, like this observation plane with retracting undercarriage and other relatively advanced features, were sophisticated designs. Greater success followed in the shape of their series of single-engine basic trainers, which were used in a variety of roles by various countries' armed services. This brilliant and versatile aircraft was to earn a reputation as being not only a well-designed plane, but also a very well-built plane. The quality of the organization of the manufacture was in itself impressive. The company first struck failure with its design for a twin-engined long-range bomber. Originally, five XB-21s had been ordered by the Air Force, but only one example was ever produced. For while the 21 featured advanced technology such as automated gun turrets, there were shortcomings in the behavior of the plane itself. However, it did give North America an excellent opportunity to explore the real needs of bomber design as well as allowing them the chance to demonstrate to the military decision makers that they were active in the field.
and beginning to come to terms with the relatively novel form of aerial warfare and the supporting philosophy, such as the concept of the independent defensive bombers by arming them with multiple rapid-fire machine guns. Undaunted by the failure of the B-21, NAA proceeded to develop another design and, using its own money, it produced the NA-40. This model took the sophistication further, including tricycle undercarriage, enabling landing at high speed. This is a model of the NA-40 in wind tunnel testing. The model's twin fins were adopted as a means of gaining greater directional stability. All in all, the design was considered vastly superior to its predecessor, but still more improvements were envisaged. By the end of 1939, world events had taken further steps towards disaster, as Europe was swallowed by a new war, distinguished by the German demonstration of the overriding importance of air power. Across the Atlantic, worried planners were reflecting on Mitchell's prophecies, and among other designs pushed into emergency development was the NA-40, with provisos that the wing be lowered and the fuselage be widened. But even though these changes were considered essential, the design was favourably enough assessed for orders to be placed for 178 of the new type off the drawing board. The first of the fuselages was dedicated to weight testing, with the main support removed added weight was placed all round the structure to test the design's resilience under stress. Thousands of pounds of lead ingots were fixed around, hung from and placed within the aluminium frame in attempting to identify any weakness that may endanger the aircraft under combat stress. The widened body would carry heavier loads than were originally intended, and these pressures may be too much for the design. If you look carefully here, you can see the panels rippling under the enormous sustained pressure, but the tests did prove the fuselage to be adequate. Elsewhere, accurate 1 12th scale models of the new design were catapulted into water to explore the shape's behaviour on a ditching. Back at the factory, different skills were being employed. Here, pattern makers prepare a mould for the top of the engine nacelle. You can see the scoop which will force air into the carburetor of the powerful radial engines which will propel the new North American design, now known as the B-25. Molten metal is poured as production of parts for the bomber commences in earnest.
the main fabrication shop, workers begin to assemble the fuselage on a jig, and slowly the aeroplane's form starts to take shape. The very early construction of the B-25 still employed a great deal of hand skills and hard labour. At this stage of production, the planes were the product of tradesmen's individual skills, most fabrication tasks being approached manually. Skilled hands and steady eyes combined with pride of trade in a hive of activity surrounding the emergence of the new medium bomber, now officially dedicated and given its name. North American's B-25 was to be known as the Mitchell. At this stage, the service chiefs would have been fairly certain that these two would be engaged in the conflict before very long. The aircraft's light weight to win ratio and the balance of the overall shape resulted in a package that was very easy to fly, and this in turn inspired great confidence and easy acceptance from the crews. Clearly, North American aviation had a winner on its hands. Early analysis from the British forces in Europe suggested that the Mitchells were far too lightly armed and, probably drawing on the B-21 developments, the manufacturers installed new turrets, including one in the lower fuselage which operated via a periscope. These added defences, although not fitted to all models, were to prove very timely because on December the 7th, 1941, another chapter in world events was to be written. Japanese carrier forces unleashed their attack on Pearl Harbor with devastating results. With the US now in the war, less than six months was to pass before it had its own carrier-borne bomber force trained and poised to attack the Japanese capital. The US retaliation could only be achieved by multi-engined aircraft working from a carrier deck. Although several designs were contemplated for the raid, only the versatile Mitchell offered the ability to take off from such a confined area and travel the distance required. A hand-picked team of volunteers had been trained to the point of perfection in short takeoff from land bases, and the forgiving nature of the B-25 was pushed to the limit. But by the time the planes and crews embarked on the carrier Hornet, there was confidence that the job could be successfully carried out. approached Japan carefully, 
but while still short of the intended takeoff point, the ships were sighted by Japanese fishing boats. The boats were sunk, but this was not before there had been radio transmission from them. Accordingly, with the risk of the loss of the carriers uppermost in their minds, the decision was made to launch the raid early. The attack on Tokyo cost several American lives, and all of the planes used were lost, ditching in the sea or crash landing. The raid had three important effects. Demonstrating to the Japanese people that their homeland was not invulnerable to attack from American forces. Causing the Japanese government to realize the same message and tie up a considerable percentage of its military power in defense of its home shores. And, perhaps most important, giving a boost to U.S. morale. The raid displayed the enormous courage of the crews which participated, and Doolittle, the leader of the raid in every sense of the word, was, fittingly, given the Congressional Medal of Honor. Standing to his left is General Hap Arnold, who was Chief of Staff for the Air Force. This is General Arnold again, seen on a visit to the North American Aviation Plant at Los Angeles, looking over the factory and undoubtedly discussing the delivery of more B-25s and the modifications to the plane that were being constantly evaluated. Arnold had his own B-25, which displayed a badge on its side identifying his rank and position. It was maintained as a transport to carry the general and his staff to various parts of the country at high speed. By now, the production of the B-25 was a matter of maximum priority, because it and the other aircraft in the US inventory held the key to speedy victory. Like many coastal aircraft plants, the North American factory at Inglewood was considered a prime target for enemy assault. With the prospect of attack, elaborate camouflage was employed to hide the production lines. In the hot Californian sun, the shade of the netting was a welcome side effect. To increase production, the LA factory extended still further, even though by this time, a whole new factory had been constructed in Kansas City, dedicated to B-25 manufacture. The Los Angeles effort even included commandeering the Hollywood Park Racecourse. During the war years, the recreation of horse racing was suspended and the idle grounds of the course were used to store components for the B-25's construction, while other areas were taken over with administration offices and sub-assembly workshops. Inglewood remained North American Aviation's main plant and became rapidly more automated as mass production techniques took over from the initial small-scale production. With a large percentage of the male population directly engaged in the armed forces, US industry employed large numbers of women workers for the first time, making the weapons of war. The demands of the military grew, the war effort gained momentum, and the daily output of the Mitchells swelled in parallel.
completed, the planes were immediately swept into the conflict, dispatched to bases around the world, and in combat, and sometimes destroyed, within weeks of production. The Mitchells found their way to practically every theatre of World War II, in many guises. An early taste of fire came in North Africa, where they were used by combined Allied forces against Germany's Africa Corps. Mitchells of the Army Air Force flew alongside B-24 Liberators and B-17 Fortresses in a persistent bombardment of Axis positions that helped greatly in forcing the eventual evacuation of German forces. Here, the Mitchells were employed in much the way they had been designed, as a conventional medium-range bomber. In this role, it had to run the gauntlet of anti-aircraft fire without deviation, with the bomb aimers focused on their targets. The bomber's support of the 1942 Operation Torch landings in French North Africa played a major role in that action and in the campaign that followed. But there was a price to be paid by the airmen. and to compensate for shortages. As planes became unflyable, they were passed for the attention of the specialist cannibals who would dismantle the entire structure in search of reusable bits. Often, otherwise useless planes would be grafted together. The resulting aircraft were a testament to the creative ingenuity of the engineers on the bases. Similar ingenuity was displayed on the other side of the world, where groups operating from a base in northern Australia made an unauthorised field modification to standard B-25s. They gave them a more substantial forward firepower by placing added machine guns in the wings, just outside of the propeller arc. These men, with their frontline experience, had perceived another role for the Mitchell, ignoring its supposed specialisation as a conventional bomber and using it as a low-level ground attack weapon. News of the success of these early flight modifications quickly got back to engineers at Inglewood. And although in horror at the danger of damage to the wings, they banned continuance of the practice, they promptly started to investigate the idea themselves back at the factory. At first, experiments were made with two additional 50 caliber machine guns located on the outside of the fuselage beside the pilot. The plane immediately gained in firepower the impact of the guns and the weight of the installation, so close to the cockpit, caused concern. If you look carefully, you can see the effect of the firing on the thin aluminium surface, inches from the pilot's seat. To compensate, heavy-duty plates were added to the design. An additional four 50 caliber machine guns were mounted in the nose, providing the Mitchell with more forward firepower than many fighters. The success of the manufacturer's experiments and the need for a versatile gun platform resulted in an extremely different plane from that conceived by the designers in the original concept. 
Soon, the Inglewood plant was turning out the solid nose variant, with its stubby profile, with little to advertise the special devastation they contain. Later solid nose Mitchells were given even greater firepower, as the success of the plane in its new configuration became evident and suggested further experiments. The modification procedure itself became refined and streamlined. Here, two gun cells are fitted with 50 calibers in a process that is simple and efficient. This carried over into the installations on the planes, making them easy to maintain in the field in the often primitive conditions of forward bases. You can see how easily these weapons can be attended to and how effective they are. The later models had the dorsal turret moved forward where, if needed, its 250s could be added to the plane's awesome barrage. Shifting the dorsal turret left the rear of the plane even more undefended and could only be carried out in conjunction with equipping the B-25 with a proper tail gun position for the first time. Here, twin 50s are installed, giving the Mitchell the same rear protection as the Boeing Flying Fortress. The ventral turret had never been a success, the periscope proving difficult to use, and it had been discarded. Side protection was afforded by single 50s. Standard solid nose 25s were, therefore, deploying the protection of 14 machine guns, and some planes were to carry even more. Many Mitchells had an additional forward firing weapon that was truly extraordinary. A single fixed cannon firing a 75mm projectile. This awesome weapon, basically a naval cannon, was for many years the largest gun ever fitted to a US plane. It was mounted directly below the pilot's seat with a highly effective damper to absorb the recoil of the gun. See here the size of the shell of the cannon and imagine its effect. The radio operator was given the task of reloading the cannon one at a time with the 14 rounds that were carried. Some air crew claimed that the impact of each firing of the gun was such that it actually had the effect of stopping the plane for a brief second of its flight. This theoretical impossibility must surely have been the physical sensation for the crew and there's no doubting the stopping power of the shells on any target they struck. The jolt of the firing on the plane is clearly visible. With these modifications, the Mitchells of all three services were able to use firepower against naval targets that was unprecedented in its ferocity and its effectiveness. Traces from the machine guns were used to adjust position to aim the plane before firing the cannon. So successful were Solid Nose Mitchells that the manufacturer's options continued in development.
arrived here with a kit that employed eight 50 calibers in a completely self-contained package. In a unique way, individual commanders found themselves with manufacturer-provided options on how exactly they wanted their plane's armaments tailored. The South Pacific was one theatre where the added forward firepower was very much employed. This was an ideal environment for the B-25. The Japanese island's strongholds did not need the saturating attention of heavy bombers, like the industrialised centres of Europe. Rather, they needed the more surgical excision of the low-flying and more selective Mitchell. The precision of the 25s provided great but economical effect. either on planned strikes or simply patrolling looking for targets of opportunity. In either situation, North American's superb medium bomber employed its weight in similar manner and telling effect, sweeping in on its targets at treetop height and accurately blasting them.
Archives employment on maritime patrol in a search and destroy role against shipping was an enormous success. The Japanese fought fiercely back and many Mitchells suffered violent ends, sometimes at the hands of flak or ground fire, and sometimes at the hands of the occasional zero. Although the Mitchell was a robust fighting machine, its use at low level meant that it often presented itself as an accessible target. Information coming back to North American on the losses among the Mitchells caused the company to make the mark even more resilient. These aircraft, coming off the production line, have armoured plate under the windscreen and the area painted yellow is all heavy armour. Production at Inglewood continued, as it did at the Kansas City plant, not only for all three of the US forces, but also for the Allied Air Forces including the RAF and the Red Air Force. Here, a very late model Navy variant and its near identical Air Force counterpart stand side by side in the final stages of production. Some naval Mitchells were equipped to handle a single torpedo which was mounted below the bomb bay so that the doors could not be fully closed with it in position. Only after the release of the weapon could the fuselage be sealed. Though effective, this must have been a very drafty way to go to war. Less than totally successful with the erratic iron bombs of the day, the B-25s would still, on occasion, tackle conventionally delivered bombing from the safety of a high altitude. Japanese shipping was the successful provision of Allied merchant naval activity, vital in the flow of supplies to the battlefields. Hundreds of thousands of bombs moved around the world in their holds. Munitions of all descriptions found their way to the fronts and to the bombers which delivered them.
specialist ordnance is loaded into a squadron of B-25s prior to takeoff for attacks against the Japanese base at Rabaul. Looking weary and war-worn, these Mitchells, which appear to be the sea model, make their way on one more mission. The distinctive paintwork of many US squadrons was more to promote group morale rather than intimidate the enemy. But with the level of attack employed by the Mitchells, it's certain that some of the livery would have been clearly visible to the Japanese troops. Mitchell was not as big and fast as its counterpart, the B-26, but there was no argument that it was more liked by its crews. For the crew of the B-25, there was comfort in the plane's responsive maneuverability, in its robustness, its ability to sustain damage and still fly, and if all else came to naught, in the fact that the plane was easy to get out of in an emergency. is to be carried out with parachute bombs, which, with their slowed descent, give the low-flying Mitchell time to escape their impact. Here, if you look carefully, you can see the effect of skip bombing where the bomb bounces off the ground on its way to the target, exploding on its second contact. Again, this gives the bomber time to escape the blast. Advancing US troops would see the results of these raids in the form of wrecked Japanese aircraft, bizarre and stark monuments to the effectiveness of the B-25s and other Allied attack planes. 
The Mitchell, even though it had been evolving steadily from the original role, was still very much the same plane as originally submitted to the Defence Department back before the US involvement in the war. In 1944, the North American plant at Inglewood made its last B-25, although the plant in Kansas City was to continue in production to the end of the war. The California plant was turned over entirely to construction of the P-51 Mustang and later jet development, which was to lead to aircraft like the F-86 Sabre. These aircraft, the last to leave the California plant, are of a batch of 1,000 H models. As they make their way down the runway, the last plane to leave is the last one manufactured at the factory. Named Old Bones, it was covered with signatures and messages from the plane's builders, the workers at the factory, and looked slightly bizarre with its graffiti covering. It was deployed to action through India and saw service with exactly the same appearance, the crew never wanting to cover the handiwork of those who built the plane that would hopefully see them home again. Many B-25s survived the war and returned to the US. In the post-war years, many continued in service in a variety of roles. In the majority of cases, the plane's immense firepower was removed, but the planes remained useful, serving as trainers, transports and communications vehicles. Many surplus Mitchells were purchased as private planes and refitted as executive transports. The versatile basic concept took all these tasks in its stride. At the end of the day, the Mitchell had been produced in greater numbers than any other Allied twin-engined bomber, and it had seen service in more theatres and in the liveries of more countries and services than any of its counterparts. Even today, the few still in the air are a joy to fly, responsive, calm and forgiving. It's no wonder that it earned itself the title Sweetheart of the Forces.